Good afternoon, dear friends uh, who joined our panel discussion. The topic of our discussion is who, how, and do they really threaten free speech in Ukraine? My name is Maroslava Marchuk. I'm host of the talk show Countdown on uh, public broadcast in Suspilna. I have with uh, with me Natalia Lukhachova, head of the NGO Media Detector, Larissa Voloshina, journalist and TV host, our colleague, and Vadim Miski is with us via Zoom. I hope that Vadim is here with us. Good afternoon. So Vadim is a member of the supervisory board of UAPBC and secretary of the Council for Freedom of Speech under the president of Ukraine. Thank you for joining us, Vadim. So is there any threat for the free media in Ukraine? Is there free speech in Ukraine? And what is pressure Within the past few weeks, we saw that uh, we are not on the same page. Uh, what is pressure and what is not? Many people do not understand what it what is this. Uh, we didn't uh, always understand what is pressure, or what are gag orders, what are guidelines uh, from above to the media. What is free speech? So this question is to Natalia first, Natalia. These past few weeks and discussions that we had between uh, the authorities and uh, Suspilna public broadcasting, is there a shared understanding on what free speech is? Is there a consensus in the media environment? Just a second, I'll take my mic. Good afternoon, everyone. The question is quite challenging because we came to a conclusion that in your situation with uh, Suspilno, with servants of the people, the administration of the president, or who were your opponents, there was no direct pressure. There was indirect pressure. I am uh, more radical towards this situation. This is my personal opinion. As for pressure in itself, in my opinion, taking into account your situation. If someone refuses to go uh, live, this is their right. But if they say, yes, we come there, however, we don't want to see this person or that person, this is pressure, definitely. Because these are representatives of the authorities. If those were experts, I can imagine a situation. I had something similar. I got to know who will be present in the studio. If I don't like someone, I'll say, no, I'm sorry, I cannot join you. And I don't even uh, need to explain why. So the authorities are obliged to be more loyal to the media. This is stipulated in the documents of all international organizations. And uh, it is also stipulated by the European Convention on Human Rights. Let's stop at that. Larissa, what's your opinion on that? What is pressure on media? I would like to say that independent journalism in any country is under a threat of pressure. But the question is, does it have tools to fight this, to maintain its standards, to carry out those tasks, to uh, be within the limits that journalists define to themselves? and to carry out the tasks that journalists have in a contemporary democratic society. In my opinion, what provokes uh, pressure, this is not understanding of, uh, this is misunderstanding of the authorities and of the part of the media community of what freedom of speech is. Because freedom of speech is the right of the citizens. To us, it is also our obligation 
first and foremost that this is obligation this is commitment of the state to make sure that uh, people have the exercise their right to access to uh, truthful information we act as a tool you must understand that when we are told that you cannot uh, say this or that or you cannot invite uh, some people it doesn't mean that it, it means that we cannot uh, guarantee this right of the citizens of Ukraine when we are speaking of independent media there is a misunderstanding for example if the media has an owner it means that uh, this media is uh, not uh, independent however that's not true independence is uh, the freedom when journalists, a journalistic community, professional community can perform their activities. In this, in this area, unfortunately, even uh, non-private, non-oligarchy media can do the same. They can also be dependent, but uh, for other reasons. Because, for example, we are speaking of funding or non-funding, whether costs are allocated or not. Okay, that's clear. Now I have a question to Vadim. Larissa started uh, tackling this topic about oligarch-owned media. And uh, there are questions, because uh, when our office at uh, Suspilne um, declared that uh, we felt this pressure, a lot of oligarchs, oligarch owned media whose owners used this wave in their own political interest so you understand what i mean i guess i'm not even saying that it was used by anti-ukrainian forces in order to undermine our credibility to say that decision of uh, the rnbo were in favor of the russian media so in my opinion it was a very complicated task to understand the question of uh, uh, fighting for the uh, right of speech and how not to misuse it you know it seems to me that in any case there would be attempts to abuse uh, the fight for the freedom of speech as element of political fight there's nothing strange about that because all politicians that uh, are in the opposition they always want to uh, to highlight uh, infringement of uh, someone's rights getting back to your previous uh, topic that you raised whether there is pressure I would like to say that it is obvious that uh, this pressure has changed during the Medvedchuk times we had these gag orders we were told which topics uh, are uh, of the priority and you couldn't cross the line for example you could show a panda in the end of uh, the uh, program however it was difficult to tackle political topics the way uh, we wanted however now situation has changed First, we have anonymous telegram channels. We must understand that there are not only representatives of the authorities and not only Ukrainian political players. However, the uh, aggressor country tries to, to spread disinformation narratives and stories through these telegram channels, which influence both citizens of Ukraine and uh, and the media what we noticed at the council of the president's office uh, there is uh, the practice when 
some people communicate on behalf of from different uh, state institutions, people who are so-called uh, self-proclaimed experts, who don't have to show their declarations, who do not pay taxes. Some of them don't even have certificates or diplomas. This practice is widespread. On the one hand, we can understand the logic why the situation is evolving in this direction. I'm uh, part of the supervisory board of UAPBC. I know how it's difficult to employ a talented person, so this person must have uh, relevant experience or, for example, relevant education because of the classifier of the professions is outdated. However, part of the problem lies within the fact that uh, people are afraid to appoint people with uh, a shady reputation. That is why they communicate as self-proclaimed experts. Then second, there are bloggers who openly voice those things which are not uh, already to be said by public officials. This practice is also widespread now. Unfortunately, sometimes it turns into some kind of informational wars. When a politician uh, just uh, sits on his high horse, looks very handsome, and his army of bloggers uh, throws those uh, uh, different messages uh, to his or her opponents. I think that most of you know the situation. That is why, of course, uh, this pressure has changed. This pressure can be exercised by any authority on the media. But it doesn't mean that, don't mean that we cannot fight it. Even the fact that it is used by oligarch-owned media it doesn't mean that this fight is destined to, to fail. It seems to me that we need to, to continue our fight. I'd like to add to that that one type of pressure is, uh, is uh, so-called phone right or self-censorship of the owners of the media. An example of this is uh, the situation with Pandora Papers. As for the Pandora, uh, the fifth channel uh, focused on this topic to criticize Zelensky. Uh, ICTV, Panchuk owned um, channels, told nothing about it. One plus one, Inter, and uh, other people mentioned this scandal because it was an international research and they also mentioned Zelensky, who was involved in it. I remember then 10 years ago, if our editorial office would reach out to officers asking to comment on that, on that situation, I think that we would find people who will express uh, the, their dissatisfaction with such policy. Now we reached out to different offices, editorial offices, and they said, we this or with that, uh, someone from the ICTV said that we were waiting for the reaction from from another person. Key problem now is that on one hand there is this pressure. It, it has changed, as Vadim has rightly pointed. However, on the other hand, uh, the media community is uh, where is is split apart. And it's very difficult to exercise uh, counter pressure as during the time of Yanukovych, when a lot of people who protested during the Kuchma times, even Telekritika, and detector, which is now a detector media, collected signatures all over the country under the memorandum uh, to fight the censorship. Now there are dozens, not hundreds, of people. Why do you think that happened? Uh, because it's difficult to prove. I often say that uh, gag orders is something outdated, is something from the past. Technologies that Vadim tells us about, anonymous uh, or not anonymous TV channels, which belong to absolutely different actors, that, according to uh, Mr. Podolak, make part uh, of the groups so that to brief the president or empires of Ukraine, there are Telegram channels or bloggers uh, that are loyal to the authorities. Thanks to those 
uh, channels and bloggers you can achieve anything and it will be difficult to prove something because you cannot prove that uh, these people are getting money from you as a public official you cannot prove that uh, you uh, call those people. There are no gag orders uh, as such. There are no verbal tasks set by, for example, an owner of a magazine to a journalist. At least it is very difficult to prove. The what What is the reason there are so few people now who are ready to defend? Well, first of all, the situation has changed in general. If previously we said that media is the main mediator between politicians and the society, and that they bear a certain responsibility, even the oligarchic media, even independent media. But there was some line for spread of uh, lies or disinformation. With the widespread of social media, bloggers are not responsible for anything. They can tell whatever, not just expressing their own peace of mind, but also uh, under the source of facts, they can s uh, give total lies. And this destimulates the journalists and the society on account of what to do, because journalists do not feel the support of the society anymore, because the society, unfortunately, is not able to critically think to such extent to differentiate between the facts and someone else's peace of mind or lies and and uh, that's how journalists disqualify their own profession and secondly the generation that was uh, in order to be at the opposition they went into politics someone in pr someone in business so there was especially after 2014 there was a shift uh, on the te television and media but the new generation hasn't um, doesn't have muscles yet and we know that the young ones are to be manipulated with because they don't have money yet they don't have their own houses or they have to somehow stay in kiev and the owners use it and it's difficult to motivate such people to speak openly remember the years of yanukovych tvi all the team left the channel but i remember stop censorship where there were a lot of young people we were all young back then Maybe it's not uh, directly connected with the age. Okay, I understand about the po your point about loyalty and age. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Marisa, what do you think? Why isn't there um, unity in media community? Maybe everybody sees it in a different way. Maybe indeed it's difficult to prove it. The thing is, apart from certain uh, you know limits and standards of the profession that's what we say what what differs the journalism from bloggers it's uh, you know facts and viewpoints and that's focus on the fact as the only argument in the conversation but there is one more thing and this differs journalism from bloggers of course bloggers they are emotional they appeal to emotions they are bright and it's popularity it's a competition between journalists and bloggers where young journalists or inexperienced journalists or journalists who step away from the principles of the profession and think that a number of likes is more important than reputation that's why they can do this in my opinion the question is the media community inside itself has lost certain um, standards because when we say about positive blockers mr padalak well, one year ago they uh, explained they have collected a pool of such blockers and they were going to cover yes but this is a paid job and these people had to be labeled of their publications to be labeled 
as advertisement in the mass media. But Fox News is not labeled that they are they that they are Trump oriented. Yes, but they are not hiding either. But here, the person gives their opinion for which they're working as press secretary, but they make it look like that it's uh, their own independent peace of mind. But the question is, but the thing is, the community is uh, shaking hands. Younger people who come into this profession, they understand their salary as journalists is like this. Their income of bloggers, blo as bloggers could be several times higher. And that's why propaganda for the benefit of some politicians and selling something on Instagram is better. So they just start thinking, why do I stick to this clean profession if I can become a star and this is my cash? And then the media community, we all know very well what is happening. And we know who is cooperating and pretends to be independent. But I'm often told, do you have evidence? What is your evidence? What is your proof? No evidence for the court but not to shake a hand I, I don't need any proof not to handshake a lot of my uh, you know uh, people who live in Crimea who moved to, to the side of the Russia TV whether they did it uh, for money or not it doesn't matter the thing is that we are we have accepted this that the order of things is like this and when you often tell each other we appeal we we you know saying that there must be some law that will make a full stop no the full stop can be made by the renovation of the institute of, in, of reputation which is our concern and this culture of not uh, shaking hands of no handshake I have been writing about this uh, as of 1990s working in the newspaper day I said that we lack this culture of handshaking unfortunately it didn't come to here but we have the war also also divided us a lot in 2010 we were young yes you said there was Novoseltsev a lot of those that uh, you don't handshake today then we were all like one camp but when the war started someone thinks this is a civil war someone says there's no war there someone started getting more money someone thinks you had Katya Sergetskova I was told I didn't hear myself but she was also speaking about this division pro-Ukrainian plus pro logakic independent and pro-Russian media but independent sorry that's not pro-Ukrainian I get this logic so they are over this uh, like fight but a lot think and me too when there's a war with external enemy you cannot be uh, in distance so the level of pro-Ukraine nature shouldn't also cross some lines so you can't lie just even for the interest of your country as for um, keeping some information that's where I can argue but still standards must remain standards even when we covered the problem how the movement of anti-vaccinators anti was uh, shown on the TV a wonderful article I'm advertising it because I think it's the role model of how you should analyze he didn't only uh, speak how many channels described it but he also told how it was supposed to be done you had to give them floor but also explain what is fake what is the conspiracy conspiration theory but the situation of war it has divided our media community in real I wanted to explain this part because there's also a certain mistake the journalism should be above policy yes it's the thesis why uh, we are unbiased and we are over the war but uh, 
the charter says that the journalism to be over the policy and protect the right the war is not politics the war is a global and total violation of rights it's an international crime and you as a journalist you cannot be over it or above it sorry above it if someone in the street might think this is the civil conflict but the journalist is to use facts which are the s s international resolutions it's a fact so that's why I'm saying, Natalia, it's, a, you know, a confusion of notions because in this post-truth period, we lose limits and framework. We don't understand. We walk aimlessly where the truth is and what is not true. Very well. My question is for Vadim Miski. I will go back to Earth and give you the example. And I'll explain why. Yesterday, this will be the question about trust to each other and to the journalism in general. Journalism, which quite often in Ukraine is not business. Media is not business, uh, but they either have to uh, work in the interest of the owner, the oligarch, or at least not to be in the way of the interest of big media holdings, TV channels, or big uh, internet outlets. Yesterday, uh, on a talk show, Savik Schuster, there was a story and the quote of the journalists uh, from Skemi about a new proof or evidence that Ruslan Demchenko, who is Deputy Secretary of Security Council uh, Danilov, was the lobbyist of Kharkiv agreements. And uh, they, he was called the person of Kajare, or the person close to the uh, regime of Yanukovych. And many questions uh, was addressed him. And this information was announced by chief editor of CensorNet, Yuri Butusov, this information. So this is uh, this information about Ruslan Demchenko and his background is a secret information but today in the social media there were comments like this the since it was said on the Ahmetov channel this information can be either motivated somehow or beneficial to the owner of the channel who's Ahmetov and so on and whole day I have been thinking where is trust then how to trust even the true information, even the secret of Polish Chanel, and how can you speak about freedom of speech in the in the open secret? Uh, are you asking this question? Because I have also the professional, uh, you know, deformity when any information they get from the oligarchic uh, media, I take as the one that is uh, engaged. I have listened to the previous part of discussion and I made notes of what I have to uh, mention. Uh, the word trust was in several of lines of mine, so you see, we coincide in this part. I wanted to start by saying the uh, the research made by internews network for the past five years of media consum media consumption in ukraine show that people a lot less trust certain channels they're watching than watching them so if 30 percent of people are watching some of the channels then they trust 20 percent less to this channel so they watch because it is shown to them no big alternative they have and during these five years we know that this alternative has started appearing suspilne for example but it's still in development no powerful uh, alternative and that's why they're watching what they are shown and in fact all it's all information, you know, uh, with the uh, the star icon, and uh, and it all is actually uh, the same that Detector Media does research. It's not something that is, uh, you know, 
propped up but it's something that we can see from year to year but a lot less people trust to it than watch this or that channel and in general in this situation all citizens understand very well from time to time i uh, give lectures to students about how media environment in ukraine works i first i do a test i asked uh, first graders i showed them the logo of tv channels and all of them know who is owner of uh, tv channels one plus one fifth channel it's not a secret for the people in my opinion everyone understands Probably people don't understand uh, who owns uh, Key One channel or some of the uh, less known channels. However, there is no secret. We all understand that an owner can influence what is told on uh, TV. We at Detector Media try to see uh, and analyze this systemic impact. Within the past few years, uh, uh, news stories uh, we analyze news stories every night and uh, we calculate mentions about different politicians for example if a politician is mentioned in news stories at different channels uh, we analyze whether this news was positive or negative if we take a look we have annual uh, analysis like that so we can easily see that for example a pfl opposition party platform for life their politicians are mentioned from 70 to 90 uh, times per day in uh, night um, news stories then at uh, inter tv channel about 600 uh, there are about 600 mentions of these politicians and uh, two-thirds of them are positive so this is clearly a violation of the standards and there are also problems which uh, happen at other channels so it comes as no surprise that owners of these TV channels spend a lot of money so they can uh, make an impact on what these journalists will or will not say if uh, the reputation of a politician is to be reanimated they will do just that for example now we see a kind of a parade of all the previous politicians at different TV channels and it shows how biased the owners of the media are when there is a conflict a crisis uh, with opponents in the authorities they can use their own media outlets as a tool uh, in this war we heard many times stories that media for oligarchs is a tool for uh, fighting for their economic interest. Yes, that's true. As Ihor Kolomoisky said, the fact that he owns one plus one makes him... I feel myself safe because I own one plus one. <laughs> well, that's true, but uh, it's much wider than just economic security or safety. We see that they use it as a tool in a political game. It's uh, not only about uh, securing the investments. I would like to ask uh, something similar to Natalia about this hybrid media community does it lead to hybrid media reality to audiences does the real reality becomes distorted of course almost all uh, huge tv channels belong to oligarchs and this is what makes uh, the reality a hybrid as well however you also asked a question your first question whether we can trust something which we hear at oligarchs owned tv channels vadim has said then no you cannot do that because that's true our research shows that even if you understand if uh, the tv channels of akhmetov there were poroshenko avakov razumkov we understand that Ahmetov wants to see those people on his TV channel. We understand that Lashko attends almost every show at uh, 24 Ukraine TV channel. We understand that uh, this is what the owner wants. On the other hand, we understand that we cannot say that that uh, they do not 
tell a kernel of truth. You just need to take a look, you just need to verify information. Because, for example, if there was an investigation by Schemy, then I trust Schemy. However, it can be m misused as just uh, an investigation of when um, Suspilna was in a conflict with the administration, with the office of the president. So the situation was real, however, it was differently used by different uh, opponents. Let us also remi remember the revolution of dignity. Uh, for Kolomoisky, uh, it was convenient because he was in a quite tense uh, relationship with Yanukovych because, Yanuko because uh, Yanukovych thought that uh, Kolomoisky supported Timoshenko during the election campaign. That is why he allowed. Uh, that is why Kolomoisky allowed uh, journalists of uh, his um, uh, Tibet channel to tell the truth. So they were very revolutionary. However, I would like to say that in 2004 it was a journalist revolution. However, this time it wasn't a uh, journalist revolution. The oligarch just allowed his journalists to take part in this quite inadequate covering of uh, the uh, events that were happening on Maidan. That is why, of course, you can watch those channels and uh, uh, not trust in anything. It's also a bad position, because otherwise people will go into social media where anarchy reigns, where it is impossible to understand, uh, where to tell the truth from uh, the lie. Some people say that uh, Shari or Leshchenko do something. However, when you read, for example, Dark Knights or Joker Telegram channels, you don't understand who's behind that. Or, uh, for example, other TV channels. Uh, sometimes we understand who's behind that, but most people don't. That is why I wouldn't recommend to mistrust everyone. You just need to tell the truth from the lies. You need to verify it using other uh, sources of information. Uh, you need to use the common sense to analyze this information. So here we have the question how we can do that, because we have uh, we understand this, uh, however our audience might not have uh, the opportunity to analyze. For me, yesterday it was interesting because we haven't heard information that Ruslan Demchenko is now works at RNBO, but before that he works at uh, the office of the President Poroshenko. Everything was known before, much uh, earlier than uh, when he started working at uh, the Poroshenko's uh, presidential administration. He was uh, prevent uh, um, he was told about that. However, yesterday nobody told about that at TV Ukraine. We have this sieve, we have the separator. So what about our audience? Can they verify this information? This information might might be distorted. It might become a hybrid. It might be distorted on this distorted and hybrid media market. So the question is that we must have information if you want to base our life on information. What we heard yesterday about Demchenko, this is uh, nothing but... Uh, um, we don't know whether it was true. You understand that a court decision was needed in order to blame Demchenko that uh, he allegedly cooperates with uh, Russian with Russians. Yesterday, uh, they said that he was lobbying for the Kharkiv agreements. Kharkiv agreements. Do we have uh, an investigation on this topic? What happened to those uh, agreements? Who lobbied that? Who took the money for pushing those agreements into Ukrainian legal framework? Was there a state reason, not the very fact of voting? Because every a any MP can say, I'm an artist, that's how I see it. I thought that it would be better. I failed. We need to prove that. We need to find evidence. Doubt just as in the US, uh, they uh, recorded every fact of Trump's behavior. They analyzed whether it was a crime or not. Now we live in a society where we have very different opinions. When we discuss, when we say that our world is hybrid, 
information which is impossible to verify and then we are talking about the post-truth world where there is no truth and anything is possible a lot of technologies create situation when it's impossible to under to tell the truth from the lies from the assumptions however any post-truth world it's not the end of history because post Pro, uh, truth gives birth to post uh, world to that is why post laws that is why when we have this uh, law in from 1997 now there are discussions whether this law corresponds uh, to the current situation this is what putin does uh, he doesn't say that the crimea wasn't occupied he just uh, says that it wasn't a crime it's like a lawyer uh, doesn't say that uh, for example uh, his client didn't kill someone but he proves he tries to prove that murder is not a crime we are coming from the post truth to the post uh, uh, world to post law uh, when we need to understand uh, what are the foundations we as journalists need to demand uh, need to uh, force the authorities to respond to that we need to see an investigation we have seen all uh, the information which uh, came to no avail uh, during the previous elections uh, investigations and court cases uh, they became a show trial a pr campaign and this is the biggest threat in my opinion because we as journalists we might know the truth but people are not interested in that because our audience citizens of ukraine they have already lost understanding of what truth is they cannot tell the truth from the lies they don't see where uh, lies what you say this is some kind of a catastrophic uh, very negative pessimistic uh, uh, view but what's uh, what are the developments it was obvious to those who lived uh, uh, during the annexation on the occupied territories this discussion where the local population wanted to have russia this or not when this discussion was happening in families uh, with uh, friends and relatives it they just discussed what is good was what is bad but back then i already understood that what we saw there was very important why people reacted like that why uh, society didn't react to it as uh, to an existential threat it doesn't matter if uh, a crime happens before your own eyes you need to understand who you are a victim a bystander or perpetrator i can sympathize with other people but i don't want it to be a victim this catastrophe was uh, seen at the occupied territories when the argument that this is a crime is no longer valid they say these are russians however when the army uh, goes into uh, uniforms so uh, without russian is insignia they perform they perpetrate a crime no country will uh, bring res will bear responsibility for what they have done uh, these are all dangerous things uh, people say that it will become better we live in the world where everyone is positive when everyone will have the right to say i have my own opinion it seems to me that it is a catastrophe uh, there might be very awful um, consequences it might uh, lead to uh, suicidal approaches on behalf of the state giving your land to russian tank tanks is uh, just as uh, given the opportunity to infection to propagate uh, these are suicidal behaviors we as journalists must understand that uh, the price of these questions the price of our work is much bigger than we think this is not about truth this is about existence the problem also is I think that this investigation by Scheme it uh, provides a lot of facts, at least uh, which relate to the lobbying of interests, uh, lobbying of uh, signing the Kharkiv Agreement. However, it wasn't proved in court, and here we have this problem.
that journalists cannot act as judges. However, they inform the society and the authorities that they need to respond. This system of response lacked uh, when Poroshenko was the president of Ukraine and during the previous uh, presidents of Ukraine, and it also lacks now. Any authorities doesn't only react, but they also start uh, being silent about that. Okay. Like on Trukhanov it was. The journalists showed whatever that was possible. Ukrainian Pravda filmed in which condition he was. And what do we have? We have nothing. Absence of response by the authorities to what media is writing about is also a problem. The West is protected from this because there they do have this response and uh, Trump, you know, also, you know, he got hurt also in many situations because they do have that culture. Uh, one more thing. It is a fundamental opinion, as Natalia said, when there is investigation, sufficient number of facts to begin the criminal investigation. And then the journalism because it starts covering this criminal investigation the society they don't understand they react like this understand don't understand approve disapprove but in reality to save the situation globally it is necessary to move in the framework of the legal procedures and to impose the opinion to the society that the legal state is protection for everyone okay dear friends it turned out that we have many questions from our audience there are questions and comments I shall read some of them for you to understand this conversation is interactive and we all speak together Yulia Hovansky I would like to mention that in Ukraine there are journalists who are not to be handshaked because of separate media groups or engaged uh, companies they give uh, the uh, they give the command them to attack but they and the, they don't want to prove their patriotic moods to separate groups and uh, many questions can be also for them so the question from Katerina the, looking at the sources of financing media, is it possible to support the Institute of Reputation in the media field? I guess I will give this question to Vadim. Vadim, please uh, answer the last question. Is it possible in Ukraine to support the institu uh, Institute of Reputation in media field, uh, given the sources of uh, funding of media? You know, I think uh, looking at the sources of uh, financing media and their political engagement, uh, this uh, Institute of uh, Reputation of Media Representatives work fine. Fine. Uh, for example, Suspilne, it's a, a specific case of Ukrainian radio when the manager says that there are no other popular talk radio stations to shape the market of radio presenters and producers of other audio genres for programs so in fact you can only uh, you know bring them up from the scratch you know create them from the scratch when those and then there are those who went to work um, uh, in the media market work in use one zig and other channels, engaged channels, and unfortunately you can't take them back. Now when Suspilne, uh, you know, managed their problems more or less and can offer this journalist not to survive but to leave working on at Suspilne. But unfortunately it turned out that these people who used to work and who have enough competence, they had nowhere to work, uh, you know, and make money while Suspilne uh, was developing so you have to prepare them from the scratch and there are many uh, different institutions which teach and uh, which have uh, the, uh, the journalists were, which are uh, values oriented uh, 
it's the Kiev Mohila Academy and uh, the uh, journal the Institute of Journalism in Shevchenko University so there are uh, students who graduate from these places and they have values of course it's going to be another change of generations but that's how this Institute of Reputation works and in my opinion you have to have a crystal clear reputation to go to work on Suspilne and this is the marker or indicator and I know so many of those who will never be hired there who work in decent channels but because of the hi history of their work background and those political orders they worked on they can never be hired to Suspilne and I think it's a very good reputational marker I also want to manage to discuss with you this because um, um, you know uh, Larissa has already started speaking about the uh, responsibility of politicians and that they go and speak to different media platforms and communicate but as for our last discussion with the office of the president on the pressure to our editorial office of the countdown that's what I was interested in it seems to me there was a small you know replacement when the politicians could choose to go or not to go to the channel or to any programs but that was not the question uh, our question was whether the office of the president and the management or press service of the party can they the how do they have the right to allow or not allow to people deputies to go uh, to the channel and express their uh, position recently i read the interview of mikhailo padaluk he, he gave to Bavel and he said that they are briefing people's deputies it's a euphemism in my opinion saying briefing before they go on air i don't know if you remember this i cannot remember such practice of briefing but i would say that uh, they are preaching them so Uh, or instructing them so what do you think it looks like when the people deputies get these briefings uh, but what does it look like if they're the subjects of the political process but not just you know some people who belong to some party where there is a party discipline and according to which they are briefed it's a widespread practice in fact instructions party instructions how to um, highlight this or that topic would say on this other problem it exists in all parties I think and these uh, you know internal um, uh, gag papers uh, gag, gag orders they were published and this is the reality you can agree or disagree with but everybody has agreed with it just like with the fact that the political force itself defines which channel to go to and what to say of course it's not correct it's wrong because indeed you say that even according to party lists but not it's not the dolls who pass not uh, someone uh, not the moppets but the personalities and we do not have the imperative mandate and everyone is to vote in the way they think it's best but as for the raised question by you and our today situation there was also a substitute of notions because we understand this was the office of the president but there w but since there was no official uh, like a certificate and even the radio had to, to write that was unofficial um, representatives but the president Zelensky he differed from other candidates promising that everything would be transparent according to the law but now the system of you know undercover of covering up everything they uh, in official do one thing and official inform another thing it has become so obvious this hypocrisy and uh, they so e easy 
they easily manipulate it that it's difficult to prove and it's difficult to prove because it's all in the shadow we are fighting the shadow business but the shadow policy policy it's flourishing it has been flourishing with other presidents too but it seems to me that uh, the that people believed this authority hoping this is not going to happen but it seems to me it's flourishing even more than before even when we had Poroshenko because there the the biggest um, uh, issue was the corruption uh, Leshenko could criticize Poroshenko uh, being the member of faction and they did not exclude him and now if somebody goes against the will of Zelensky Razumkov or Burgmister, they are just excluded from the party. I can say when Dubinsky is excluded from the party, but there is the direct grounds for it. These are sanctions by the USA. But when it's about thought possible to send the draft lot for the Venice Commission, but what what is wrong with that? So here's the, I think the fight inside of the party and the interpretation, fault and opinions differ. And it's a life and death game there, uh, which ends in being excluded from the faction. Although for Poroshenko, the situation was also very specific and there were also its political interests. But unfortunately, this practice is present uh, for a long time in Ukraine and it hasn't disappeared now from what Larissa said as I understand we are speaking about no handshaking we are we are, we're talking about shaping social demand for truth shaping social demand for the politician not to behave this way by the way i'm always giving an example when i managed to communicate with one of the presenters of hard talk at bbc and when i asked them how do you manage it was after some interview very important interview with a british politician and asked him how did you manage to bring him in how did you arrange this that he came to you and then the presenter of hard talk said that he wouldn't dare not to come because our politicians understand that but our politicians they dare they can choose a hot path instead of the opposition channel or um, public broadcaster so I think it is connected with the fact that the society is speaking on the position of losing on the weak position what is your vision? I lack, you know, we lack horns, you know, that the politicians would feel. If I walk in the street and I understand that the person who um, I meet there, they can, he, that person can say, tell hi, but is not going to slap me on my face, that's the limit. And a lot of us remember uh, our favorite about the that uh, fence or limb b boundary set in Kaidasheva family but us as post-colonial society we don't understand this uh, you know marker what the state uh, this uh, boundary of what the state can do and what can't do by the way as the voter I see that it's unacceptable when my people's deputy is uh, the hand raiser but Razumkov he's also the official speaker and his boundary is the law that he has to act upon the society doesn't understand the boundaries that it doesn't require these boundaries the police officer doesn't have the right to do this but I have to you know do this or that well for example even if they stop me they can't put me on the asphalt so we have such things so you're saying this is the post-colonial thing yes 
it's uh, between anarchy i mean chaos and absolute agreement to any owning of us just for us to have anxious salaries or just some bright future it's all post-colonial because it's a transformation of post-soviet myth like we will uh, destroy classes expropriation of the expropriators for everyone to be rich and nobody had a question that expropriation it's a uh, stealing so why do we steal and how will we be rich after this or live happily and freely that is these are the consequences but we will you know overcome this when it happened to Trump with accusations towards Trump uh, before the election campaign, he was accused of cooperating with the Russians during the pre-election campaign. And there were no uh, information about this Mueller um, investigation. Our Verkhovna Rada made a decision, uh, adopted a decision to do something similar. Uh, the society didn't understand that, that uh, they stole from us that uh, the Wagner Commission is not a commission that uh, we need to have independent prosecutors so it seems to me that uh, it's something childish so what am I now to give it over for summing up this discussion so who do you think uh, is uh, developing this demand in the society to help politicians uh, who are not puppets, who must to be, uh, to, who must to report to the audience that uh, we set the moral and ethnical framework for the politicians and not vice versa, and especially if the mono majority, if they call themselves servants of the people, who shapes this, who develops this request? I agree with you, Miroslava, that we have a lot of problems. Society doesn't know where this limit is, where this red line is. I must agree with you. And you also, we also must understand that Ukrainian society loves uh, uh, suffering. We suffer and suffer and suffer and then boom, we explode. This patience, this long wait is also a disadvantage to us. Because on one hand, we live from one explosion to another explosion, from revolution to revolution. And on another hand, between these revolutions, be between these explosions of anger, everything starts with civilized rules, with promises that everything will be uh, open and transparent. However, it ends with corruption uh, perpetrating all the levels of uh, the authorities. It seems to me that the question is similar to the question related to the internal uh, confidence in the society, confidence and trust in institutions. If there are institutions that we are ready to trust, for example, for us, this is a public broadcaster, Suspina, we know that no matter what, and no matter who is the president Poroshenko or Zelensky, it will always be neutral and biased and truthful. Uh, this is uh, the note, uh, this is uh, the camera tone that we can check information which we receive from different uh, sources. Because sometimes it's interesting to take a look at uh, the show, not only Countdown, but at other channels, because, uh, because it's also interesting. But we need to uh, review your program, Countdown, or new stories at Suspilne, and uh, to be on the same page with what is happening. This institutional support to those institutions uh, who do not uh, cheat on the society is very important. This is exactly what we need to do. Thank you so much, Vadim. Thank you so much uh, for your speeches. One more question. Alena Baraza writes, why, what about physical uh, threats to journalists? So the journalists must feel safe and secure. They must understand that law enforcement investigates crimes against them. Uh, we are all waiting for investigations uh, of uh, murders and assaults on our journalists. We are still waiting for the results. Those investigations 
and uh, telling the names of the those who ordered those crimes will be the marker that will s persuade us that we are in safety. But I'm sad that uh, there is this suspilna uh, movlenya, suspilna UAPVC as a tuning fork. So on one hand we need to promote it, on the other hand uh, we need uh, independent media to develop, because right now we don't have a lot of uh, this independent media. One of the reasons is that smaller media enterprises are not ready to develop, uh, to support development of the uh, media just uh, to do it uh, on a sustainable basis, to give the society the opportunity to grow and develop, uh, to have these long-term perspectives for our children and grandchildren to live in a democratic society. That is why it is important to support regional and national media. Natalia Lihachova, chef editor of Detector Media, Larissa Voloshina, journalist and TV host, and Vadim Miski, secretary of the supervisory board of UAPBC, uh, these were our speakers today. We discussed uh, the question whether there is a threat to Ukrainian media to the freedom of speech. Thank you so much for staying with us. Thank you for your attention and see you later.